Good evening, everybody, and thank you for coming today to the Italian Cultural Institute of New York to celebrate President's Day with us. It's the um, second event of the series of the Italian conductors in New York City. Um, usually we host conductors that are performing, uh, conducting uh, at the Metropolitan Opera because our series is dedicated to Italian opera. Today we have a different kind of opera and a different kind of, uh, of conductor because Rinaldo Alessandrini will conduct tomorrow at the Carnegie Hall L'Incoronazione di Poppea, which is an early opera, so it's not considered in the repertoire uh, of, the, of the classical opera. Uh, it is, in the fact, considered the first opera okay, of, the, of the history. Uh, Claudio Monteverdi is considered one of the creators of the opera and the first to bring it to the uh, to the excellence and uh, and from there start the history of the, the great history of Italian opera through the 18th century and uh, and the 19th century. Uh, Rinaldo Alessandrini will conduct tomorrow as, at the Carnegie Hall. As I said, it's the last concert of uh, La Serenissima, this festival dedicated to the city of Venice that started uh, on February the 3rd and uh, and so basically every day one concert or more than one concert every day so uh, we were we we are very proud to be partner of the Carnegie Hall of this festival we are still hosting here uh, the exhibition memories of the Serenissima about 19th century Venetian art it the the exhibition is part of the festival uh, and also other events that we hosted here and in other in other venues in the city. So tomorrow is the closing night, and I hope to have everybody at the at the Carnegie Hall tomorrow. Rinaldo Alessandrini from uh, Rome, Italy. He's uh, one of the most renowned conductor in the um, in the early opera. And not only in the early opera, because the Madrigale and uh, Mozart, yeah, of course. Uh, uh, Rinaldo Alessandrini is not only a conductor, but he's a, a virtuoso of the harpsichord, uh, organ, uh, so ancient uh, keyboard uh, instrument. And uh, since uh, 30 years, uh, he's the uh, the founder and the leader of Concerto Italiano, one of the most famous ensemble in the in the field of baroque uh, music uh, and uh, and baroque opera, uh, they did more than thirty CDs. Am I right? More, more than sixty. Okay, I'm I'm late. <laughs> and uh, and as I said, we are very proud to have them to have the ensemble here in New York tomorrow for. Uh, L'Incoronazione Ipopea, one of the masterpieces of, uh, of Claudio Monteverdi. Harvey Sachs, our friend musicologist here, like every, every event in the series, to conduct the, the talk. So please turn off your mobile phones and enjoy the, the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Fabio. No? Yes? Yes. Um, so this is uh, somewhat different, as Fabio mentioned, uh, from some of the events that we've had before because we were talking with conductors whose main focus is on 19th century opera and who uh, perform uh, mostly at the big traditional opera houses. Now, many of you may know that really over the last generation or so, there has been a movement to recover and to perform as correctly as possible um, music written before 
the uh, classical period, the early Baroque period and before. In, generally, in the English-speaking world, we refer to this as early music. is isn't, re I mean, depends what you consider early. Uh, you know, music, the history of music goes back as far as humanity goes. So we're still talking about a relatively limited time span. But the fact is that uh, a lot of research had to be done in order to begin to re-exhume, in a way, a lot of the works of the past. And uh, it's people like Maestro Alessandrini who have carried out a lot of this work. And I would like to begin by asking him to talk a bit about the kind of work that has to be done to perform an opera of Monteverdi, for instance. It's not exactly like looking at a score by Mozart or Beethoven or Verdi or Wagner where essentially everything is written in the score. Of course, it all requires interpretation. But in the case of earlier works, it's a much more complicated uh, type of, of uh, job to carry out that interpretation. So perhaps Maestro Alessandrini would yeah. talk a bit about uh, that. Um, the Monteverdi composed this opera uh, at the very end of his life. The during the last nine years of his life, he was back. Yeah, he was back to the opera after a long absence. Uh, we mm, can consider his Orfeo that was composed in uh, 1607. Mm. We can consider Orfeo that was done in uh, Mantova as the, uh, the real first opera. But after, after Orfeo, uh, Monteverdi was engaged as um, a maestro di cappella, so conducting chapel in, in San Marco in Venice and he had a very very busy time because uh, he was in charge of the renovating the, the chapel just selecting new singers selecting new instruments but what happened in Venice during this first half of the 17th century was the opening of the first public opera house uh, 1637, San Cassiano. Sounds right. Exactly. <laughs> so the very first public opera house it was in Venice. And, uh, well, the opera uh, became uh, suddenly and very rapidly the new fashion, I mean, the new amusement, especially for I say in English carnival, carnival, mm -hmm. carnival, carnival time, yeah, period. just before Lent. And uh, this is why living in in Venice, Monteverdi was called again to to compose for the for the public theaters. And uh, as I told before, three last years of his life, he composed three operas: um, <coughs> L'Incoronazione di Poppea. Enea e Lavinia, no, uh, no, il, il ritorno di Ulisse in patria, Enea e Lavinia e l'incoronazione di Poppea. Uh, unfortunately, Enea e Lavinia is lost. We know that. I think we have the libretto, probably. Mm -hmm. We still have the libretto. And we, finally, we have only two operas, really by, by chance, because the, the, the only score of Ulisse uh, is at the moment in Vienna and is a copy. We don't have autograph uh, scores by Monteverdi. And uh, in Coronazione di Poppea we have two scores very different each other. The first is, well, one of the two is conserved in, uh, in Venice and there's a score that was made by Francesco Cavalli, that is another composer, 
uh, that was uh, working in Venice. And uh, some years uh, after the premiere was deciding to revival Popea. And he prepared a new score. And uh, there is another copy that is conserved in Napoli that is also uh, a copy. But uh, there are a lot of different elements when we compared these two scores. Sometimes it's really two different operas, totally different operas. Um, during this very first year of composing opera, uh, you, you should image a totally different situation. Uh, there was not a beat, of course. And the orchestra was a very small one and a very particular one because the, the main part of this composition was based on a uh, voice, of course, but the accompaniment was made normally with uh, uh, harpsichords, one, two, three harpsichords, it depends on the house, and a uh, number of big lutes called chitarrone. And uh, it was one of the most funny, uh, one of the most funny story about Venetian o uh, opera houses was the huge number of chitarrones. That is a, a big lute with an, an uh, enormous neck. That all these necks of the these instruments were covering the stage. <laughs> yeah, and. Uh, they also were uh, used to have some string instrument, but normally strings were used just for playing small sinfonias or ritornelli, almost never playing together with the singers. It was very, very, very rare. This is because the, the, the style of this very early opera is a very particular one. Uh, we are talking about with Popea, we are talking about uh, 16, 40, 41, something like this, yeah. And uh, the opera was really invented just uh, 40 years before in Firenze, and just 1600. But it was just a case. Uh, the, the story was that uh, there, were the, there was a group of intellectual people. They were dreaming about uh, a revival, possibility to revival ancient Greek tragedies. And they were discussing and talking a lot about how it could be possible to perform again this style uh, after this conversation, there were uh, some composers that were accepting in some way the challenge and trying to compose music in this style, not necessarily opera, so Caccini, Peri. And at the same time, they were imagining to put, uh, to compose music for some long stories. We can consider these long stories like mainly Euridice was the most important, most um, considered uh, libretto or plot. We can consider, for example, uh, Peri or Caccini, Euridice as the first operas. It's very simple music, just one line and very few instruments. M uh, there is a very nice letter by Monteverdi where he wrote, okay, I, I was in Firenze. I was in Firenze meeting these people and listening to their speech. But it was such a confusion, I mean, so strange speech. And, uh, but Monteverdi was very engaged with his work. He was in Mantova this time. And uh, in a moment, he says in one of his letter, he was reflecting on the, uh, an idea coming from uh, Plato, Platone. When Platone is speaking about the, what he said, the, the imitation of ideas. And he was thinking about the possibility that the music also can imitate ideas. And uh, at that moment, Monteverdi 
uh, started to elaborate a new theory that for us is very strange at the moment when he says, okay, so we have a text, we have music. And uh, why the music cannot reflect the emotional power of the text? Uh, I mean, today's is such a, can be a ridiculous speech because of course music, we know the music just because the music is, is talking together with the text, just reflecting all the emotion of a libretto. But at this time was a kind of revolution. And uh, this is why in, in a way we can consider Monteverdi like the creator in some way of the modern music, Western music. He was not alone, of course, because there were a lot of composers around him just walking into, into the same direction in different cities in Italy. But when we consider these two examples of operas surviving, so Popea and Ulisse, and when we compare these two operas to other operas of the same time, we can realize that uh, his ideas was perfectly elaborated. And then these operas are absolutely logical and complete. Even if the orchestra is not a big one, like we are used to, uh, to, to listen when we listen Mozart operas or Verdi or Puccini, uh, it's the, the final result is absolutely perfect. Uh, one of the most important details is that he was very lucky to, to meet two very good uh, poets, Badoaro and Busanello, and especially Busanello, that is the the, um, the librettist of Popea. The libretto of Popea is a perfect one. It's an absolutely incredible story of politics, sex, corruption, and it's a fantastic story because all the roles are um, sono tutti cattivi, non c'è un buono. Right, they're all bad guys. All bad guys. No exactly. good guys. Exactly. <laughs> and it's a, I would say it's a, a, a real modern history. So, at this time, the way of composing was a very simple one. Just writing the vocal line, and just under the, the vocal line, another line, giving chords, only chords. But no indication about the instruments to, to use for realizing this accompaniment. But we know. Uh, we know that what was used to do in the public theaters in Venice at this time. So the orchestra, or what we can call orchestra, was made by two, three harpsichord, keyboard instruments, lutes, probably no harps, probably, we're not sure, and very few strings. Sometimes when the production was very rich, they use trumpets for particular reason, probably, but no wind instruments normally. The most of the effect was mainly based on a singer <coughs> and a very simple accompaniment made with harpsichord and lutes. That is absolutely simple. I mean, uh, we, we could say that almost there is no music. It's a, very, it's a very particular idea of theater, opera. It's just a text uh, that is given with some pitch, of course. It's music. I mean, uh, you can listen music, but there, there are no arias. It's just a text speaking. So just telling the story where all the roles are acting. There are very few, in, in, in Coronazione Popea, there are probably three or four points when where we can say okay this is an aria but it's very short one one minute no more the rest is what we call recitativo but it's not like a recitativo it's not a recitativo like uh, we see for example in Handel or Rossini or Mozart it's totally different uh, at the time the, the, the composer they, they were used to call this style uh, recitar cantando that is acting and singing at the same time so it's a 
It's a way of uh, s singing, just speaking with some music. But uh, there was a very uh, important difference was recitar cantando, acting and singing, not cantar recitando, singing and acting. This is very important. This is the most difficult, um, this is the most difficult for uh, modern singers when they have to understand this style. I mean, the, the, the most important is speaking, not singing. I mean, singing is essential, of course, but it's not the, it's not the more important point of this style. So, and when we start to say, okay, let's open the score, we don't have uh, any indication about the instruments to be used. We know which instruments. Then it's up to us to, to decide, okay, we have here uh, harpsichord with gerbos or without. We know that they were used to, to have two harpsichords just um, exchanging yeah, the, the, the role, following different singers, and the lute playing together. That's all. I mean, but the, the final result of this sound is a, is a, a really exciting one because uh, the audience can, be really, can really focus the, the text, the declamation of the text, the meaning of the text, following the theatrical action. Uh, probably the music is lagging, but I mean, listening to this opera, we are not looking for music because it's a, you, sh you could probably image like a kind of Shakespeare, theatrical uh, work with music. It's more, more or less the style. In particular, Monteverdi in Coronazione Ipopea, it's really, it, there are two different plots together, the historical one and the comic one. And the two plots, they almost never, are almost never uh, over overlap. Mm -hmm. yeah. There are two different operas. And uh, the, um, the historical one is concerning this, the, what is happening between Nerone, Popea, Ottavia, and, uh, and Ottone. And then there are the, some more roles, small one, and the plot of the comic uh, side of the opera is a very explicit, sexually speaking one. That it was, it was absolutely common. The, the Venetian at this time, they were loving this kind of very, <laughs> uh, can yeah, I say? Explicit. Explicit yeah. comedies, yeah. So for people coming tomorrow, it will be probably surprising because we will be on stage and the orchestra is made with uh, mm, even less than 10. But there are a lot of singers because th there are a huge number of roles. Some singers are singing more than two roles, of course, because that I think that, that it's around 25 different roles. Mm -hmm. in Popea, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just to go back a little bit, uh, Maestro Alessandrini mentioned that, uh, mentioned Shakespeare. In fact, they were exact contemporaries. I'm sure they probably had never heard of each other, almost certainly had never heard of each other. Shakespeare was born in 1564, Monteverdi in 1567. Monteverdi far outlived Shakespeare. Uh, Shakespeare, by the time these operas were written, Shakespeare had been dead a quarter of a century. But um, in fact, these things were developing at the same time. Also, if you visit Florence, uh, in the Quartiere uh, Santa Croce, there's a palace that's called the Palazzo Bardi, and there's a big plaque on the building that was put up in the 19th century that says that this is where the Camerata Fiorentina met the people, the poets and musicians, most of them amateurs, in fact, <coughs> Maestro Alessandrini mentioned, this is where they met, and it said that this is where they put an end to the barbarism of northern European composers. Well, why did they say that? It's because at that time, polyphony, this very dense way of composing music in multiple layers, uh, mostly for the church, but also 
in secular music had become the thing. And all of a sudden, with this development of the recitar cantando, uh, there's a break with that style. Of course, the 19th century people who put the plaque up were exaggerating completely because many of the composers like Monteverdi also composed dense polyphonic multi-layered works as well as uh, this kind of work that then became opera. But um, it's interesting that that was a sort of moment of uh, stylistic break in the history of music and Monteverdi is in fact one of the most important composers for that very reason. Um, now, how do you go about realizing uh, what instruments exactly to use where when you're putting together a production, a performance, since there aren't explicit uh, indications of instrumentation and so on? How do you, it's a matter of, I suppose, personal taste to some extent and... Well, not exactly, I mean, the, the, the uh, departing point is the use of harpsichords. Mm. I mean, having two harpsichords uh, playing in the same scene, uh, this is the bass. So saying, okay, this is me, this is you, we are two players. And uh, then, I mean, what is very nice with the sound of tiorbos or lutes is that they they can add what harpsichord in some ways is not uh, is not able to do. I mean, they can add some resonance to the chords or some brilliance. And uh, but I can mention a very mm, nice story. I was talking with um, a colleague years ago, and uh, it's a lute player, and she told me that the, I don't know which opera and where exactly in the UK. They were trying to play um, uh, Monteverdi opera, probably, with uh, the usual orchestra, I mean, harpsichord and lute, playing all time together. All time together. Hmm. And she told me, well, you know, it was so simple in some way. I mean, we had no, uh, no needs of deciding uh, instrumentation. And uh, the audience was not regretting any lack of uh, uh, diversity of sound. And I mean, it could be also a solution. In, in my case, I mean, we, tomorrow we have two turbos and one harp. And uh, we try to focus some particular moments in terms of expression or sound, I mean, where there are some uh, charming uh, erotic moments. We can have just only harp mm -hmm. or two turbos or when the speech is very soft. But the most of the time, if in fact, we, we play together, combining a uh, harpsichord and turbos, or the second harpsichord and harp, or inverted solution. But, uh, and anyway, I mean, Pope is one of the, the opera I conducted the most in my life. And I remember that I've changed instrumentation probably a thousand of mm -hmm. times. So mm -hmm. it depends also from the, from the, the size of the, of the whole. How about tempo, tempo indications? Are there uh, frequent tempo indications in the score, or is Absolutely it determined not. by Absolutely the... Absolutely not. Right. No, but what is very important, this is why uh, I was mentioning that this kind of writing is not exactly the same, uh, it's not the same recitativo we, f we see in Handel or Vivaldi or Mozart. This particular writing is a, it's a very subtle one, I mean, uh, when you analyze the, the, the rhythm that is composed by Monteverdi, if we follow exactly the rhythm, the, the, the speed of the rhythm indicated by Monteverdi is corresponding exactly to a possible declamation. So, in fact, it's not a freestyle. What is free is, a kind, is the way of beating the half note. Mm -hmm. But what is happening in between the, the, the bar should be absolutely, absolutely regular. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is why, I repeat, this can be very strange for singers used to sing a normal opera 
and just accepting the challenge of <coughs> speaking and not singing. I mean, just focusing the most of the oppression on the possibility of speaking and just forgetting to be singers for a couple of hours. One very important, uh, in, in my opinion, one very important information of, of this style and especially of the, as we told, the, the break between the uh, 16th century tradition and uh, the following century is that uh, there was also a, a huge change uh, concerning the attitude of the audience. Because before the, the, the beginning of the 17th century, listening to uh, these big motets, counterpoint motets, was a, a very, was a kind of, I can explain, was a very simple act. I mean, audience, they were just accepting the music in some way. There, there was not a critical approach to the music. With the opera, but the new invention of having just one singer and the accompaniment, what was uh, really amazing for the audience was this new contact that is created between the performer and the audience. It, it can be considered almost a kind of personal contact. At this time, finally, the music is considered like um, uh, an occasion to express emotion. So the, the, the performance is really very interested in the reaction of the public. The, the, the performer now is carrying the quality of his performing because he knows that more the audience is engaged in the performances and better is the result. Before, the, the technique of composition that was counterpoint was, uh, can I say, uh, the mastery of the counterpoint was the most important. But the audience had not this kind of critical approach. So it was, uh, 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 finally it's, uh, it's like if you pass from a kind of, let's say, uh, obje objective, objective. Object objective approach mm -hmm. to a subjective approach in the performance. It was not only the creation of the Western music, but only the, also the creation of the of a new audience, of a new attitude for for the audience. I mean, I go to the theater because I want to attend to a funny, funny show. And before this, the the, the people they were used to go mainly in the church where the music was performed, but it was not a theater. So they were listening to incredible motets, thirteen, five, thirty, thirty-five, fourteen voices. Some huge construction of sounds. But saying, okay, I like, I don't like, they were not used to do this. With the new century, this was the most funny. I mean, I like this, I don't like this. I think we could perhaps look at uh, an excerpt, the prologue from the uh, Incoronazione di Popea with Maestro Alessandrini and his Concerto Italiano. The, the, before, maybe it could be interesting, the prologue is, uh, the, there are three roles, fortune, virtue, and love. And in the, in the prologue, fortune and virtue are discussing, saying, no, I'm the most important for human being, fortune or virtue. And love is arriving at the end of the prologue and say, hey, wait. I am the most important because what I decide is the most important. You, I, I don't care of, of, of both of you because the power is, begin, is belonging to love, not to the fortune or virtue. So it's a comic scene, in fact. Okay.
So that gives you a sample. Um, the performance tomorrow is not staged, right? Or no. semi-staged, yeah. semi-staged. Now, in previous uh, encounters that we've done here, we've talked specifically about what the conductor does. And all of the previous uh, guests we've had last year and uh, again with Maestro Nozeda this year, we've talked about more or less what we could call traditional uh, repertoire, opera performances, and so on. Um, this is a whole different kind of experience, and I would like Maestro Alessandrini to talk a little bit about what the difference is between conducting music of this period and conducting later repertoire. I, I don't know if we can compare. Is there, there are, these are two different totally different jobs. Uh, when you are, you are facing an orchestra, you, you have a lot of problems to solve about playing together, playing at the same time, and so on. We don't have orchestra here, so the main, uh, with the, our, our job is mainly focused into the expression of, of the singers and trying to to develop uh, the m most elaborated degree of simulation because the effect of this music is mainly based on the, on a the simulation because they uh, the, the only resource they have is the voice uh, the, the, this opera are m mainly based only based on the effect of the voice as you have seen there is no we cannot really consider this music. I mean, there are instruments, but it's very special, very special solution, very special combination of music and text. Uh, but so the working in um, for Monteverdi opera, all rehearsals uh, are used just uh, in order to focus elements of the librettos and just uh, analyzing the libretto and analyzing all the opportunities for the expression of the libretto. You, s you rehearse the singers, I assume, first without the other instru the well, instruments? Uh, or the, it depends on the house. Normally when you start a production, you, you have the singers and a modern piano. Right. So you start just talking about the libretto and see how approach the libretto. And, uh, mm -hmm. But the music is a... Uh, in some ways, uh, it's a second secondary element mm -hmm. for this kind of operas. When you rehearse uh, Mozart or I don't know Handel, Gluck or Rossini, uh, there are different kinds of problems, mainly vocal. Yes. We don't have pr vocal problems here. I mean, it's not difficult music to sing, but it's very difficult to find a, a good and nice balance between singing and speaking and talking this is very uh, because it's a, it's a completely different style it's a very it's a totally forgotten style of singing and uh, it's so far away in our in our culture i mean uh, we are talking about music composed uh, more than 400 three 400 years ago 400 yeah. years ago yeah, yeah. and uh, after this we 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 have Vivaldi, Handel, Mozart, Bellini, Rossini, Verdi, Puccini, and I mean our memory is is totally full of uh, different approach. But in some way we can say that this particular result uh, during this f uh, the first 50 years in in Venice. Uh, it's, a, it's an incredible combination because the chemistry in some way is, um, uh, I, I, don't, I don't mean that it's, it's a better chemistry, but the role of the libretto, so the role of the text and the sound of the text is very important. And, uh, well, it's, it's different. It's simply it's different, very different. When you conduct later music, Mozart, or 
after, in some way does your understanding of this earlier style inform or influence your approach also to later music? Yes, for sure, because anyway, I mean, uh, approaching Monteverdi, what we learned is the, the power of a text. Uh, what we learn is the, it's a method of analyzing a, a libretto. And just uh, we learn to discover opportunities in the libretto. And what is very interesting is, is uh, to, to work on a possibility to translate the expression of the libretto, even if we have some obligation done by the music. But it, it is always possible to, to find a particular sound for some particular situation, for some particular words or adjectives, and just to manipulate the sound of the voice and trying to, to create a particular expression for a particular moment. And mm -hmm. this is uh, essential for Monteverdi, probably less essential for Mozart, but it's a kind of uh, interesting spice. Yeah, and Mozart also composes to the text when he's composing All opera. composers, yeah, yeah but I mean, uh, but I mean the, the, the balance different. is different because yeah. you have a beat, you have an orchestra, you have uh, orchestral colors, you have instruments that are illustrating in a way, yeah, the same, mm -hmm. exactly like Monteverdi, but the, the, the speech in some ways is more complex. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I mean, especially if you compare a libretto of a, of a Monteverdi opera with a libretto of a Verdi opera, some of the Verdi opera libretti, if you just take them on their own, the language is very uh, convoluted, and uh, it's not something that you sort of read on its own and think, well, this is really beautiful. Whereas some of the Monteverdi libretti, you can read Absolutely. as a separate text, and they work. If you, you can know? take half an hour just to reading the uh, Busanello libretto of uh, Coronation of Popea, it's fantastic in itself. It's perfect. It's, f in my opinion, it's one of the most perfect libretto that is done mm -hmm. has been done for for, uh, for an opera, especially especially Popea. It no, it takes no more than half an hour, forty five minutes, uh, if you have a good English translation. But it's absolutely perfect. And whereas, if you read, you know, Il Conte ne duopo attender vigilando in Il Trovatore, that sort of thing you get to the end of a paragraph and you have to go back and figure out where the noun and the verb are, you know. Uh, it's a totally different sort of approach. It's the, it's the musical impact that counts. And here it's this very tight uh, connection of music with, with word, the recitar cantando. Um, what about, uh, how, how, uh, late in repertoire, do you go in your own conducting? Uh, <coughs> normally, end of 18th century, some few Rossini. In terms of opera, when working with orchestra, I can, I like to go, even uh, later. Yeah. 20th century. I did a lot of contemporary yeah. music. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I see a lot of connections between older music, the pre-Baroque and early Baroque music, and contemporary music more than with Romantic, for instance. Or ah, yeah, for sure. Sorry. Yeah, but uh, it's, I mean, conducting Romantic operas is a very particular job. Absolutely. Absolutely. For sure. And even comparing Romantic opera and the Mozart opera, they are totally different styles. Yeah. So, and, you know, conductors are expected to know, to do a lot of different things, more even than, you know, you can have a, a pianist who specializes in uh, Bach or Beethoven or uh, uh, virtuoso type repertoire list, Rachmaninoff and so on, and really focuses on that. Conductors are usually expected to do a wider variety of things, especially if they have their own orchestra or opera company, then they're expected to, to work in a, in a much wider sort of repertoire. 
Thank you very much Thank for you. being here. Thank you, Maestro, for participating. Thank you.